chapter 18 and verse 1. Jesus spoke a parable unto them to this end. somebody else and say, I'm going to always pray. All right, you said that in the house of God, standing up. Some of you had your right hand up. That all counts. Amen. But people ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't give up. Don't fall by the wayside. Because you shall reap if you don't faint. If you faint not. her as a widow, likely she was in poverty, she had no husband, don't know if she had any family, she didn't have anything to offer the judge, she was just a widow, and although she needed justice, he would not for a while, because like some judges, he just looked at the power as an exercise for his own. Grandizement, you know, just, you know, more about himself and less about his purpose. His purpose is the justice of God. Not man's justice, God's justice. Which is not always the same thing, because man's justice is perverted. And uh, this guy said, he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. The Lord said, hear what the unjust judge says. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. an unjust judge if somebody keeps pressing their case might eventually be convinced to do what is right Jesus says shall not God if you being evil willing to do this how much more God is able to one writer said in fact the writer of Hebrews if you're willing to give good gifts and to do things what Jesus did actually switch it back the trains here uh, but if you being evil are willing to give good gifts to your children how much more God right will give you the Holy Spirit to them that ask him and much more, how much more God will give good gifts to them that ask him the writer of Hebrews talked about how as evil uh, fathers, fathers with with imperfect hearts, uh, correct your children uh, for their benefit and try to do what is good for them. How much more so uh, your Father, which is in heaven, is going to chasten us, not just for our, His own pleasure, but so that uh, for our own profit, so that we can be partakers 
in his holiness. Yeah. And all of this Jesus taught to emphasize the point we ought always to pray. Not to think. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us to internalize the fact, to recognize remind you, some of you, uh, some of you slept through the class, that's okay, uh, I'm not here to um, hold you accountable, but in high school science, you were studying classical mechanics, and in there you studied this one guy named Sir Isaac Newton, and uh, considered the father of modern science, but um, he had among the breakthroughs or the things that uh, uh, he contributed to science. He had what we call Newton's laws of motion. And uh, you're familiar with them, even though you've forgotten them. Uh, but the first law of motion was the law of inertia. The basic idea that something that is at rest is going to stay at rest unless another force moves or acts upon it. And I know that that phone that I placed there is going to stay right there. Not because Newton said so, but he defined the law that helped explain why it's going to stay that way. On the other hand, that same law tells us that something moving in a straight line at a constant speed will continue to do so unless acted upon by another force, a countering force uh, against it. And then what happens just depends on the strength, obviously, of that force and the force of that object that is in motion. And Galileo, another one of those guys you remembered and forgot from science class way back when, he figured out some of this by rolling balls down in fine planes. Not airplanes, like mathematical planes, just a flat surface. And uh, uh, he rolled down these balls and he recognized that unless there was another force uh, working against them, that ball was going to continue going down in that same exact direction. Now, there are uh, some things that, that interfere. You know, there's friction uh, as it rolls over the uh, whatever it is, the, the board that is there, air resistance that slows them down, gravity uh, can, can work against us and has its own influence. Um, but we use this to explain, Galileo did this to explain why even though the earth is moving, we don't feel anything. Anybody feel dizzy right now? No. And yet you're spinning at somewhere near 1,000 miles an hour. As the earth rotates on its axis, right? Down by the equator, it's slightly above 1,000 miles per hour. But rotating that fast, and yet, you're just like, fine. You can get up and walk, and you, you can jump and hop, and you can do flips and do all kinds of stuff. And you, you don't lose your sense of motion. Why? It's part of this is this idea of, of, uh, that Galileo was, was bringing out. And yeah, we're spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, a little over that at the equator, we're also traveling at about 67,000 miles per hour as we orbit the sun. We're moving, huh? And yet none of you have your wind blown. I mean, some look like, no, huh? But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're just perfectly fine sitting at peace here. Why? Well, it's kind of like when you're riding in a car, right? And whether you're driving at 40 miles an hour or 70 miles an hour, there's my hand, um, uh, you, you, you're driving, you're just, you're at peace. Your whole body is moving at that speed within that car. And if you have something laying on the side like your phone or, or uh, something else, your drink, uh, you're not worried about it being thrown out or whatever. It's just secured and it's traveling with you at that same speed. 
that you're traveling. And so the whole entity travels, and it's unaffected by uh, feeling as if, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, we're losing our sense of, uh, of uh, balance or, or anything else. Now, that was the first law of inertia. I promise I won't get too deep into this. Uh, but the second law that uh, Newton had, the law of motion, had to de deal with momentum so that there were various things like speed and mass or weight that influence uh, the momentum, the force by which something traveled. So the faster something going, the harder it is to stop it, right? It's one thing to stop that little kid when they're just kind of strolling along, but it's another when they're just turning that corner as fast as those little feet will go. It takes a little bit more strength to kind of catch him and say, whoa, we're not running in here today, uh, or, or whatever. Um, and, uh, and the greater the weight, the harder it is, which is why that 220-pound running back coming at you full speed, uh, you're, you're, some of us are going to think twice about just trying to hit him head on because he's got a lot more momentum than us. And if somebody's going to bounce backwards, it's likely to be us. So uh, that's momentum. The third law then acts on it, the third law of, of uh, motion which has to do the impact that happens when two opposing forces collide against each other. When they, when they work, if they're equal forces, then, of course, they'll come to a standstill at some point. If they hit each other dead on uh, with, with no, um, you know, slight, alter, like if something is round, obviously it's gonna, there's going to be a bounce or whatever. If something's slightly off-centered, it's going to send them careening off in a different direction. But every force or every action, the more common phrase here is every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Right? Those of you have been in science class, you remember some of this. I know. It's traumatic for some of you. We'll have counselors. Sister Patricia will be ready after service to help you with the trauma from that. Um, but natural laws reflect spiritual laws. So that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and they ate of the one tree that God gave them, right? Oh, they, well, God gave them many trees. He told them they could eat of all of the trees that were in the garden. It's just the one don't eat of it. Why? Well, because God didn't want you enjoying that pleasure. No, 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 that's not it at all. It's because he knew if you ate of that tree, it would unleash a certain force in you, what the Bible calls the law of sin, that would begin to work and it would produce death, increasing death, greater forms of death in every way. Well, Adam and Eve, we know the story. They did eat of the tree. And death, the Bible says, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And that's what happened. Death immediately began to work from the inside out. Their spirit immediately died. And so they were separated from God. And then from there, death began to work in other aspects of their lives, in their emotions and in their impulses, their, their desires. All of this began to be corrupted. And so we see things like, like uh, Cain becoming angry and moved with hatred against his brother Abel. And, and he rises and he kills him one day. And, and jealousy rises and envy. And, and there's covetousness and, and various other impulses that we have. Uh, uh, sometimes Sometimes they're perverted sexual desires. Our desires were corrupted uh, to make it to be outside of what God had designed for us. If things had been like they were designed in the garden, everything would have been good, including what you want. But now we have this, what we call the forbidden fruit syndrome, where, where we have a desire sometimes for things that we know we shouldn't have just because we know we shouldn't have it. Just because they said it was illegal. Just because they said, somebody said, no, you can't have it. Well, now we really want it. Yeah, all of this, the process of death. And so our emotions get corrupted. And so it's not, uh, things are out of balance and out of focus and warped and twisted and, and distorted. And, and so uh, it, it not just sadness, but now we deal with uh, significant depression. And, and, and we're dealing with fear and anxiety. And, 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 and our emotions are all over the place. And, and we're trying to regulate it. And we have to teach our children how to regulate their emotions. It's not natural for them. And so if they don't get their way, they're going to pitch their fit. And you have to help 
discipline them, to help them gain control over their emotions. This is not acceptable behavior. We don't say certain things. We're not going to scream. You're going to sit there and look me in the eye. And all the things that we teach them want to help them learn to regulate their mood. Because otherwise, they're going to go every which way and they'll be even further out of control. The bigger they get, the stronger they get, the more that sin nature begins to work. It doesn't get better with time unless there's effort made to discipline them. So, anyway, this whole force of sin was unleashed in Adam and Eve and through them to all of humanity, all of mankind. And so Paul wrote to the church and he said, By one person, by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men so that now all have sinned. We have the sin from Adam. We also have our individual sin. But it all happened from that first uh, step where that poison, that spiritual uh, force, the law of sin, was unleashed in Adam and Eve and passed on genetically uh, through all of their children, all their descendants after that. Paul went on to say that by the offense of one judgment, came uh, of one judgment came on all men to condemnation in other words to a point of being sentenced uh, to where there was no hope they are without hope they are condemned and that is humanity condemned verse 19 Matthew 5 I mean I'm seeing Romans 5 he said by one man's disobedience many were made sinners Romans 7 and verse 5. He said, when we were in the flesh, he talked about the motions of sins, which were by the law did work in our members to bring us bring forth fruit unto death. In a certain motion, there, there were things that were already set in motion. Uh, James talked about the course of nature or the, uh, the, the process that happens by our DNA that, that we start off like this, but, but with all of our genetic packages, we have DNA that's a little bit corrupt here and a little bit faulty there, and, and no, no human being is born with a perfect DNA package. And so this this sin process, it begins to work. It worked from the inside out, uh, from the spirit of man uh, to the soul of man to the flesh of man. And and sickness and disease began to come uh, on Adam and Eve and all of their children. uh, And they eventually died physically. And everybody that's ever been born since then has died. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. But that's because of sin. And the wages of sin is death. Sin will naturally produce death. It's just the way it is. Lust, when it conceives, brings forth sin. That lust, that's the desire from the sin nature. It's going to produce sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And so every one of us, if Jesus doesn't come beforehand, we're not going to find immortality on our own. What's going to happen is that we'll all die. A hundred years from now or more, uh, it We'll all be dead if Jesus had not returned and, uh, and us be resurrected or changed before him. It, it's something that will naturally happen. It's just there. And even though you may not see the process of death in that brand new baby that is born, that, that, that uh, it's got life and youth and power, whatever, yet even in there, there are weaknesses. And the, the sin nature has worked against its mind, against its spirit, against its body. So... Sin started a process, didn't just separate humanity from God, but started a process that drives man on a course running farther away from God. And, uh, uh, and, and we'll make certain efforts to try to slow it down. There's, there's things that we'll do to, to help. It's kind of like with your physical health, right? So no matter how healthy that child is, Uh, and hopefully they are free from sickness, disease, and various other things, eventually that child is going to die, maybe 70, 80 years later, but it's going to die eventually. And, and, uh, And we'll do certain things that can help the quality of our life and maybe even lengthen our life a little bit or or not short-circuit it. So we will make sure we get certain uh, um, uh, nutrients for our our bodies. We'll we'll diet, we'll make sure we eat healthy, all this stuff, and and not do other things that that cause a a more quicker uh, breakdown. I know that's bad English, but I just did science today, no English. 
uh, more quickly. Uh, it will break down. And uh, uh, so we, we do things. We'll exercise. We'll get our heart rate up. We'll, we'll lift weights. We'll do whatever's necessary. Why? Because we want to get the most of whatever bit of life we've got here. But no matter how much you exercise, and no matter what medications you take or antibiotics to kill off a virus or this or that, or, or no matter what kind of nutrition you have, it can help, but you're still not going to reach immortality. Why? Because the force of sin is so strong, the force of death is so strong, nothing can conquer it. No wonder the scripture and others talk about the sting of death and the victory of the grave. Why? Because given enough time, everything that lives in our world will die. It's the sting of death. It's that power, that force. It's like a freight train. It's so big. It's so, so powerful that it, it, it's going to come. Nothing's going to deter it. We make our efforts to counter sin. We reformed. We try to become disciplined. All those things are helpful in, in their own way. But they can't stop the process of spiritual death either. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, when he talked about a, a, a system that was brought in to help with this whole idea of sin, uh, he said that even that, even though that came from God, the, that the blood of bulls and of goats could never take away sin. He said it was impossible, Hebrews 10, 4. It's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could ever take away sin because it's got such a powerful motion that, that, that it's like, you know, you throw a tennis ball at a, at a, state, a freight train. That tennis ball is going to bounce right off. The freight train's not even going to know that you threw that ball there. Too much power, too much motion. And what you're going to need in order to stop that freight train is an equal or greater power on the other side coming against it. Now, any force that would be as powerful as death, according to Newton's law, following the same line of thinking, it could only stop death. But it couldn't reverse death. If you have a dump truck waiting, weighing 10 tons with its stuff on it coming one way, and another dump truck weighing 10 tons coming the other way, and they do a perfectly matched head-on collision, it will stop. Each dump truck will stop the other, but it won't make the other go backwards and start going in the opposite direction. That would take like some massive, massive uh, uh, force to be able to do that. So a greater force is necessary. So when Jesus came, we understand that in him was life, right? The word that came, the word that was God, John chapter 1, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And, and that word also was made flesh. That's, that's how he came to us. And, and uh, so we have Jesus here, whom then Paul later refers to as the spirit of life. We know God is the author of life. All of life comes from God. It doesn't come from a laboratory. Laboratory can mix chemicals. But the same chemicals do not produce life. Life is beyond the laboratory. They need life to produce life. Life comes from God. Life is a gift from God. Um, so that's why when, when Jesus came and he died, we talked a little bit about his death and burial the last couple of weeks, but when Peter was preaching about it on the day of Pentecost, he said in Acts 2.24 that it was not possible that Jesus should stay dead. Why? Because there was a greater power in him than even was in death. Because with God, there's, it's not an equal power. It's a greater power. It's not a power that can stop death. No, it's a power that can raise you up from the dead. 
You may have already died, but there is a promise that Paul said that it shall come that when that trump comes, uh, in the twinkling of an eye, we're all going to be changed. Not just those of us that are alive and remain, but even all those that are dead. There's going to be something reversed. There is a power greater than death. No wonder he could say, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Because there is something far more powerful in God. Amen. Amen. Reminds me of the story. I haven't told this one in a few years of an old preacher. This this that's a close to a hundred years ago when this happened. Uh, God, a man that God used mightily for miracles and wonders and signs. And, and he was taken into uh, one of our elite laboratories uh, where they're medical, doing a lot of advanced medical research for that day. And they had, I don't remember what it was, but some kind of, of uh, substance in there that was um, uh, a very deadly virus. And uh, he was allowed to look at it under the microscope and, you know, the powerful microscopes they had there. And, and as impressed the preacher was with all of this, uh, he was like, uh, well, you know, what, what if I just held some of that in my hand? They're like, oh, no, you don't want to do that because it will seep through the pores of your skin. And, and once it gets into your bloodstream, it will kill you. Something came over that preacher. He said, no, nah, it won't kill me because I have something in me that is more powerful than the death in that virus. And they were like, you know, preacher, you just don't understand science. And, and uh, he in insisted, I want some of that in my hand. And, and Darren, they're like, okay, we're not responsible, all of this. Uh, and uh, they say, allowed him to put some of it in his hand. He held it there for a minute. He said, now put this under the microscope and see what you see. And when they looked at it, that virus was totally dead. He said, I want you to know that there's a Holy Ghost in me that is more powerful than any death that this world has. No wonder uh, Paul said, if that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, it shall also quicken your mortal bodies. When Jesus returns, there is a power. Now, I'm not saying we need to go, you know, and do stupid stuff with poison. But what I am saying is this, that there is a greater power in God, that there is a greater life in God than any effect of sin or death could ever have. Even where there's a lot of sin, Paul said, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. You get the grace of God, the favor of God, the influence of God working, and that is more than enough to compensate and to go beyond anything that sin does. Yeah, the life of God is more powerful than the force from any death. Now, Newton's laws apply to inanimate objects. They apply to things, matter. They have no will of their own. But in the spirit, God's great force, his grace, his spirit working requires your appropriation, your will to appropriate that grace to your life. You can frustrate the grace of God. Paul told Titus, he said, the grace of God has appeared to all men. And it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. That's what the grace of God does. But, but we have to receive the grace of God. We have to accept it. We have to allow it to, to work in our life. We can harden our hearts from it. We have a free choice. That's how God, that's how God made us. So it requires your will to receive it. So even though 1 John 2, 2 talks about how Jesus sacrificed, he was the propitiation for our sins, and not just our sins, but the sins of the whole world. In other words, he didn't just pay the penalty, he was way more than enough to pay the penalty. Way beyond. It's not that he had just enough blood shed to wash the sins away of everybody that lived. No, he, his blood was more than enough for all the humanity that could ever come into existence in eternity. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. It's a propitiation. It's far more satisfying. But even though that's the case, we know that not all men will be saved. 
because not everybody's going to take that grace and, and, and allow that to work in their lives. 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter said, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is the will of God. Paul said that it's the will of God that all men should repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. This is the will of God. But it's not going to happen because not everybody's going to be saved. The book of Revelation tells us about a certain judgment for those that, that are that, whose names are not in the Lamb's book of life. So what it requires is for us to appropriate that grace uh, into our lives. And that requires faith. In Isaiah 45 and 22, God said, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I am a just God, a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me. You've got to look to him. He said, if you'll draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Now, this is about your response to God. It's about your desire to seek after God. It's about what we call faith. Faith, if it's faith towards God, it's allowing God's power then to work in my life. That's what faith is. I believe God. We sang about it a moment ago. I trust his word enough. I trust the power of your word enough to seek your kingdom first. There's a power in God's word. And if we choose to believe it, if we choose to exercise faith, then we open the doors for that to work in our lives. Amen. No wonder Prophet Jeremiah, speaking for God, said, Call unto me, and I will answer. Psalm 91, God says, uh, Because he set his love upon me, I will deliver him. I'll set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. It takes faith in God to call on God. It takes faith to pray. It takes faith to obey the word of God. It takes faith. It, it took faith for Naaman to decide that he was going to go ahead and dip himself seven times in a stinky river he couldn't stand. It took faith for him to do that. But when he did that, then the miracle happened. Then God was able to release to him the miracle and the healing that God had already intended for him. Amen. We can give up so easy. We pray a little bit, then we'll get a little struggle. We don't get the fruit. We don't get the reward. We don't get the recognition. We don't get the honor. Things don't happen for us. And, and then we just kind of get a little tired. But Jesus said you ought always to pray and not faint. Always to pray and not give up. Pray. You're always exercising a faith. You're hitting a why? Because as you're doing it, it's like directing the laser of God's grace. The laser of his power to work in your life. He won't work in your life if you refuse him. But if you'll open up, he's got a whole lot more even than the goodness he has allowed already. Without faith, you can't please God. But if you have faith, then what you're going to do is pursue him. Because faith is going to know that he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of them that seek him diligently. Of them that diligently seek him. Those that pursue him. It's counsel. And, and be not weary in well-doing, because in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Stand with me, if you will. If you faint not. Your faith is going to be tried. 1 Peter 1, 7. Peter talked about the trial of your faith. Being more precious than gold. Though it be tried with fire. It's going to be something of great reward to you if you allow that faith to be purified. If you allow that faith, uh, 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 even after it's tried, you don't give up. You keep pressing. You keep pressing. You keep praying and don't faint. Why? Because if you keep doing it, you're going to reap the reward if you faint not. 
Men ought always to pray and not faint. Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 3, 13, he said that the fire is going to try your work. So if the, the fire is going to try your work, but, but just because the fire tries your work uh, and, the, and the fire is trying your patience, uh, it's the trial of your faith, uh, uh, the trying of your faith, uh, that you cannot just give up. Men ought always to pray, not faint. Because you see, prayer puts you in contact with a power that's greater than sin. Prayer puts you in contact with a power that's greater than death. Prayer puts you in contact with the power of the Almighty God. When you're praying to God, and when you're praying to God, that's your faith towards God. You call on Him, and He will answer. And it focuses that power of God on your life. It focuses that power of God on your problems, on your sickness, the finances, uh, the mental problems, uh, uh, the uh, relationship problems, whatever, uh, the things that we struggle with, the things we think we need. My Father knows that you have need of this. Jesus said, He knows you have need of all, but seek first the kingdom of God. Why? Because if you can get that faith directed towards God, if you allow that to continue, then you're going to find all these other things going to be added unto you. All the other stuff is easy, but the real problem is they get the power of life working in you. Amen. Amen. That's why we pray. That's why we seek the face of God. That's why we don't give up. That's why we look for opportunities. We don't just get drafted into prayer. Eh, some people get drafted into prayer. I remember a long time ago hearing uh, somebody say, well, Sunday morning lets you know how popular the church is. And Bible study lets you know how popular the preacher is. And prayer meeting lets you know how popular God is. desire from you, God. Lord, that your will would be done, that your kingdom would come, that your spirit would be poured out, that lives would be changed, that chains would fall, that deliverance would take place, that bodies would be healed, that miracles would take place. Hallelujah. Turn. 
amor escrito. 